Well, good morning, Greenwich. Today is Monday. It is February the 8th. Great to welcome you to another edition of the Basement Academy. Uh, we had another snowy Sunday that impacted our attendance at worship, but I trust that you were able to connect from home. Uh, for the many who did come out, it was good to be uh, gathered together uh, in the sanctuary. Uh, always a joy uh, to gather with God's people for worship. Um, in case you missed it, a couple things that we mentioned yesterday in worship. We are uh, conducting a church-wide congregational survey. Uh, there's a button on the church website. Also, you can link to it through our Facebook page. Mm, it's got maybe 16 or 17 questions. I forget where the final um, survey came out. But it's about your sense of connection to Greenwich, how you connect, um, and then some things we're thinking about doing to maybe increase a, a sense of connection. In particular, we're interested in our what we're calling our Greenwich Beyond community. Folks who, who live at a distance, uh, but who are becoming part of the Greenwich uh, family uh, through virtual worship and perhaps through these uh, engagements as well. And so uh, if you go to the Greenwich Church website, GreenwichPres.org, um, you'll see the survey there probably takes no more than five minutes. It's just click, answer, click, answer, and away, away you go. Thanks. And then um, on Sunday the 21st at 7 p.m., we're, we're simply going to have a f church family conversation. N nothing wild and crazy. Uh, we want to share a highlight video from last year, just photos from our Vespers services and food drives and other experiences, but to celebrate ministry and life together. Um, and then just open the, the floor for, for conversation, but we're doing it via Zoom. And so um, you would register for that and then receive the Zoom link. So register at GreenwichPres.org, send an email, and you'll get the Zoom link. So we'll, we'll remind you again and again <laughs> between now and the 21st. Uh, Psalm 128, one of the morning psalms, if I may. This is one of the pilgrim psalms. Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your sons will be like olive shoots around your table. Thus is the man blessed who fears the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion all the days of your life. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem and may you live to see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Amen. Lord, hear our prayer this sweet prayer of blessing. May it rest upon each of us in our homes, for our children and grandchildren, the fruit of our labor. May it be abundant for your glory. And so strengthen us as we begin another day and another week together. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Um, we're going to turn towards uh, questions and answers. Thank you for the many who have submitted questions. You may continue to do so. Um, there should be that um, opportunity to do so on the church website and the, the Facebook page. Again, those are, those are two places to always check. Uh, before I do so, though, I, I received uh, in the mail from one of my pastoral colleagues from my Colorado days, John Hess, living now in um, Montana, and he sent a sweet little note and came over the weekend. It's, it was a couple pages from um, uh, Natan Sharansky, who was a, essentially a, a prisoner of conscience in the Soviet, by the Soviet KGB, who was released uh, during the Gorbachev-Reagan years. And this is describing his release. And he talks about the Psalter that his wife gave him before he was imprisoned. It was like the last thing he got, and then, then he was taken into prison. 
And let me see, he, he writes here about that they wanted him to leave everything behind as he's going for this release. Uh, I kept protesting whenever they insist I leave everything behind, including my book of Psalms, a special gift from Avital I had received a few days before my arrest. I had spent weeks in hunger strikes and punishment cells because I insisted on keeping this gift, which she managed to send via Jewish tourist airmail from Jerusalem. Since then, my regular meetings with King David, the psalm writer, had entertained me, soothed me, and improved my Hebrew. This was no time for us to break up. Kind of a, a, a whimsical way of talking about that. The KGB wanted him to leave his psalms aside as he's being taken to release. And he says, no, I'm not. <laughs> and then he wrote uh, elsewhere, <clears throat> finally, so now, now that he is released, finally, after nine years, I can turn to King David for praise, not just comfort. I read the psalm that I had chosen years ago, back when my release was still an impossible dream. And then he talks about reading Psalm 30. Uh, they, they wanted a statement. He says, I'm just going to read Psalm 30. So isn't that interesting? And this significant event, some may, may remember that. Um, and then finally, he talks about a series of phone calls he gets from uh, Shimon Perez, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel. And then he gets phone calls from George Shultz and then Ronald Reagan, George Shultz, Secretary of State, and Ronald Reagan. And then <clears throat> he's asked the question, how could you have been so calm? People ask me today after watching videos of those conversations, those conversations with heads of state. By then, nothing could ruffle me. I was living my dreams. If at the moment I had been told that the next phone call was coming from King David himself, it would have made as much sense as everything else. After all, wouldn't it have been natural for me to compare notes with my comrade in arms, that's King David, after we spent all that time together? That is, and this is why John sent, sent this little excerpt, knowing my love for the psalm so well-timed, as we have been studying for, I guess, five weeks, four weeks of kind of the, the, the lecture, How to Pray the Psalms, and then last week, the Psalms Lab. So I, I just, I point that out. The Psalms are dear, dear, dear to God's people, sustaining Natan Sharansky uh, in that brutal, brutal experience. Okay, so just wanna take on some questions today. Uh, we'll, we'll go through, I've got three that I think I'll, I'll have time for. If we run out of time, I'll just pick up tomorrow and, and go from there. So the first question, um, I'll, I'll read parts of it. It really has to do with Psalms Lab, and so that's why I want to take that one first, and then other questions kind of move in, in other directions. So the question is, in your Psalms Lab, you mostly use the pronoun we for your prayer rather than I. So uh, first person plural instead of just first person singular. Is this true in your daily praying the Psalms, or is this a habit from your call in leading public prayer. Using the pronoun I would seem to make your prayer a personal conversation with God. So let me stop and there's a little more. And so the, uh, the, the writer of the question, I think, astutely observed that in my prayers last week, I would use we. Um, great question, great observation. In my own daily prayer, so I just prayed my five psalms, my day eight psalms upstairs. Um, and in that context, I mostly am in the first person singular. But as the psalm warrants, if it's because sometimes it is first person, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Okay, so that's all first person. But there are other psalms that do reflect, you know, the collective. Uh, for he is our God, and we are the sheep of his pasture, Psalm 95. And so, so I, I, I kind of pray the psalm according to what it is, but there may be times when the psalm trigger, that, that phrase or the verse, 
may prompt me to a situation where it is a collective, be it my family, it may be something to me, but I might pray for my, uh, not only the, the five of us, uh, the Meeks household, but, but the broader um, extended family, brothers and sisters, um, et cetera, sister, you know, my, my wife's side. So, so I pray according to the psalm, but the observation was astute when leading public worship. And so in my psalms lab, I didn't think it was appropriate for me necessarily to pray personal things, but I am doing that on my own. I'm, I'm confessing personal sin, um, but last week in Psalms Lab, I might have offered collective prayer for sin, okay? So that was, that was uh, kind of a, a collective confession. So, so astute observation there. So I'll follow the individual psalm uh, per se. The, the question goes on, my observation is that you are using the psalms as a trigger for your own word uh, prayers. I do not, this is the questioner, I do not necessarily do this very often, but this process could be used throughout the day to spring into a prayer spoken or unspoken given the circumstances. Exactly. That is exactly so well observed okay so I, I commend the questioner here watching the news seeing someone in a store or other public space reading scripture talking with another observing someone in church that car in front <laughs> that is upsetting to oneself <laughs> reading a book magazine or newspaper or even to pray for don meeks as he starts his sunday message these could all be triggers and prompts for prayers exactly this could fall under the concept to pray constantly. So the notion of psalm trigger, verse, you know, so I called it a springboard, but trigger is probably even a better word. So I, I, I thank our questioner for that. And so, yes, the psalms give structure. They give language. They give opportunity to explore one's own soul and one's own self and struggles so again they help us to mature but then they provide us not only specific triggers but the notion or this idea of oh my god goodness all life could become a trigger for prayer yes 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 thank you that's exact and that is how i pray and often as you become familiar with the psalms you will find the out and about praying that happens, kind of the triggered prayer, often comes psalm fragments, okay? And th th so the, the images and language of the psalms begin to embed themselves into our lives. And, and we're, by, again, by praying them out loud, by saying the words, hearing the words, seeing the words, we become familiar so that when I'm out and about and I see a situation, I might actually use that psalmic phrase or that psalmic image. So not only are the out there triggers for prayer, but then they trigger psalmic prayer um, as we're out and about. And that is part of, I believe, how God would have us to pray constantly. Final little portion of this question, do you also pray the Proverbs? Uh, what about in your scripture readings? Does that uh, reading trigger prayer? And the answer is simply yes. Uh, I do pray the Proverbs in the same idea, same way. I'll just read him, read, 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 oop, and something catches me, and I offer the prayer. Same with my, my own biblical reading. I, I read through the Bible in a year, so I'm right now in the book of Numbers and was struck today. Um, Mo, God talks about from the congregation one will be raised up uh, to it's really moses handing off to joshua but appoint one to lead the congregation lest they be like sheep without a shepherd and i was just like i know i've read that but because we just studied matthew 9 about jesus looked at the crowds harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd and it calls all the way back to that um, passage in number so jesus is ultimately the one appointed to be the good shepherd. So fascinating uh, study. So yes, I, I pray the Proverbs. I pray my scripture readings. I pray the Psalms. Pray, 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 pray. <laughs> okay, so great, great question. Thank you for that. 
Uh, next question has to do with um, uh, recognition of baptism between the Roman Catholic and Presbyterian churches. Very simply, I was baptized as a baby in the Catholic Church. Does your church recognize my baptism as valid? And if not, why not? Very simply, yes. And so in the Presbyterian Church, we do recognize Roman Catholic baptism, so there would be no need to be rebaptized. Um, we don't rebaptize. So if somebody has come from another Christian denomination and has been baptized, we do not, in the Presbyterian Church, we do not rebaptize. Um, and I, I get that uh, question from time to time. Uh, somebody might have been baptized as a child and they want to make their own expression of faith and want to be rebaptized. Our, our expression is a reaffirmation of the baptismal vow, okay? And so uh, I am not authorized to baptize a second time. I will, uh, there's a liturgy that enables us to do that. But specifically with the Roman Catholic and Presbyterian recognition, there was a time when um, it did not flow back the other way where Roman Catholic, um, uh, so the, a Presbyterian baptism would not have been recognized in the Roman Catholic Church. But really, uh, I did, did a little poking around with this. Um, it was until 2013 there was a, a common agreement or a mutual understanding that was reached between the Roman Catholic uh, Church, uh, the Conference of Bishops, I think is what it's called, um, and uh, several uh, Protestant denominations, one of which is our denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA. Uh, the, the key in baptismal recognition is, was water used and was the Trinitarian formula, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When water is used and the Trinitarian formula is present or used, spoken, then this is Christian baptism and that is recognized. Um, there are some denominations that only baptize in the name of Jesus because in, the, in reading the book of Acts, um, they see that, be baptized in the name of Jesus and you shall be saved, Acts chapter two. Without doing too much of a deep dive on that, um, my training and my vows uh, call me to a Trinitarian baptism uh, from Matthew chapter 20. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, so there, yes, so there is, rec there is a mutual recognition of each other's baptisms uh, in the Presbyterian and Roman Catholic Church for which I am very thankful. We yearn for the day when there's a mutual recognition of the Lord's Supper or Eucharist. Uh, sadly, that has not yet been fully um, adjudicated within the ecumenical movement. And so we, would, we, we always welcome uh, Roman Catholics to the, the communion table at Greenwich because it's not Greenwich's table, it's the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Roman Catholics are not yet, in my understanding, able to open the table to those who are outside uh, the, the Roman Catholic fold. And so that remains a, a place of, of sadness and, and some tension uh, within the Christian church. But that wasn't being asked, so we'll leave that aside, okay? So, okay, so two questions. Uh, let me, I think I've got time for one more. Uh, this is uh, kind of a nice, robust question here. In Exodus chapter 32, Aaron reacts to the people of Israel by taking their gold, throwing it into a fire, and creating a golden calf for them to worship. The people were later punished. Was Aaron punished? If not, why not? Great question. What a great question. So I think we know the story. The people of God have come out of uh, Egypt. Uh, the Exodus, as we call it, they've gotten out into the wilderness. They've gone through the Red Sea, out into the wilderness. Moses uh, goes up onto the mountain, receives the Ten Commandments. 
but there's a little bit of delay in the action and so the people are getting restless and so they come to Aaron who was Moses' brother and say hey we don't know about this Moses fellow make for us a god <laughs> and then Aaron says well take take all your you know earrings off and bracelets and whatnot because they had spoiled the Egyptians they had gone and asked the Egyptians before they left they'd asked all their neighbors for silver and gold etc and this is the material that ended up being used for the construction of the tabernacle okay so that's where they these slaves get all of this material and so God gave favor they spoiled the Egyptians and so I think we know the story uh, Aaron so Moses comes back down <laughs> from the mountain he hears the sound of revelry and Aaron what is this you've done and he talks about well I you know put the gold in and out came a golden calf lo and behold no he had to have had a hand in that right and so he he kind of tries to play a little innocent and imagine that's two brothers right who have been through a lot uh, already so um, the people are punished but Aaron is not at least not immediately <clears throat> and so it's a great question um, one could argue that Aaron his punishment as it were was delayed uh, Aaron experienced the death of two of his sons who offered unholy fire um, uh, all of a sudden I just lost their names, Dathan and Abiru. Um, and so that we read about that in Leviticus. And so one could argue that trouble has come to Aaron's family. Um, Aaron himself dies without uh, being able to enter the promised land as Moses, similarly for a, a, a future to this event, a future indiscretion that Moses engages in. Um, is prevented from entering the promised land. So one could argue that Aaron's punishment um, did did come. Um, Aaron had been promised prior to the golden calf um, event uh, in chapter 28 of Exodus. God says that Aaron is going to be the high priest and then his sons will be priests. So they're from the, the tribe of Levi, the, the priestly tribe, but Aaron is going to be the, the high priest. And so perhaps one answer is that, okay, God had already promised this priesthood and so to secure that and execute that part of God's plan, um, that he was, Aaron was not punished immediately for the golden calf incident. What is profoundly tragic and ironic, which I think illustrates the reality of sin, is that here is Aaron having witnessed the power of God, the ten plagues, the uh, parting of the Red Sea, the going out, the, the closing in of the Red Sea over um, uh, Pharaoh and his army. Aaron has witnessed God's power, okay? He's been promised this priesthood to lead God's people in worship. It could be that he kind of gets a little confused and thinks, well, I'm going to be a priest, and the people know that, so maybe maybe this is what it's supposed to be. So, you know, kind of a, a confusion about what worship is to be about. So he leads the people in false worship. So it's kind of a priestly act, but it's in an unholy manner, okay? So there's some irony, but the, 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 the tragedy and, and the, the, the depth of reality of sin, even in, in Aaron's life. Um, so as I, as I was reflecting on this, <clears throat> it, it kind of begs a question that, that's, that maybe broadens out a little bit. Sin and its punishment or its consequent do not always correspond in the manner that we think it perhaps should, right? That there, um, there's not always a one for one. The, the person sins, the person is punished. Um, you can stretch back. So Cain slays his brother Abel, but Cain isn't put to death immediately, but the mark of Cain is placed on his forehead so that everywhere 
he goes, people see, oh, there's Cain, there's Cain, there's Cain. And so, and so, so he is not, the, the, we might think, well, Cain should die. You know, he, he put Abel to die to death, so we should remove him, kind of capital punishment. But that's even a more, perhaps even a more painful punishment. Cain does eventually die. The wages of sin is death. All of us uh, ultimately die as a punishment for our sin or a consequence of our sin. I um, was thinking of other places where this happens. Um, a, a general uh, gives directions and orders uh, for troops to uh, engage in battle in a way that may be uh, foolish. Uh, the intelligence is clear, but the general sends uh, people into battle anyway. The general is responsible for that action. The, the soldiers die and all of the, the, the fam so So we see where there's a separation from the actor and then those who suffer the consequences of those actions. And so that might be one um, Thing where we see that in life, or a drunk driver uh, plows through an intersection, hits a family out on vacation. They had nothing; they were just innocent. They were just driving to the beach. We hear those kinds of stories, and and why doesn't the drunk driver die? God, well, that person caused the event, their actions, and yet this other family. And so that those are those are troubling and challenging uh, questions. And so I think the Aaron. Um, and golden calf kind of ties into that. My mind went in that direction. And so there's not always eye for eye, tooth for tooth, is there? Action and consequence are not always immediate, but they're always there. Uh, one of the themes that runs through scripture is in the judgment, the, the ultimate judgment, um, um, that we will each be rewarded according to what we have done in the body or in this life. There's, there's different ways that scripture says it. And so um, I think it's a great question uh, about why Aaron wasn't punished. I think it has probably, it probably has to do with the priesthood. And so, because uh, the scripture doesn't, doesn't clarify for us. So I kind of lean in the direction of thinking it probably has to do with the priesthood. It probably has to do with illustrating the reality of sin that the one appointed to be the high priest could easily be turned aside into false worship, which happens later in the story, of course, sadly, uh, when the priests bring idols into the uh, temple there in Jerusalem centuries later. Um, and then subsequently, Israel is punished for that uh, as a nation in the exile. Um, and so I think it, it begs gospelly kinds of reflections, um, actions that we engage in <clears throat> that may we may not perceive them at the moment to be idolatrous or unjust or in some way wrong, but they are. Or in times we may actually engage in actions that we know are wrong, and yet God does not smite us in the moment. And so I think there is this, this tension in Scripture, but I think it's also illustrating, um, really goes back to the garden. Adam, the day you eat of that fruit, you will die. But he didn't die, did he? Or, so Adam and Eve didn't physically die when they ate the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but their death happened. They died in relationship to one another. They died in relationship to God. And so the fig leaves and the finger pointing and the hiding in the bushes and all of that excuse making is reflection of that. Physical death came subsequently. Okay, so, so again, uh, cause and effect, sin and punishment, action and consequence are not always one for one immediate. And it points us to the mercy of God. That the, the, the wonder is that any are saved because none of us deserve heaven. And so perhaps the Aaron and delay is, is also trying to illustrate that, that there is time for repentance, there is time for grace. Now, we're wondering about those poor people that engaged in the idolatrous worship. Well, they had a choice in that too they could have chosen not to. 
they could have they could have said hey wait a second this isn't right <laughs> and so we we emphasize and stress personal responsibility for our lives and we we thank god for the for the mercy and and grace of jesus that none of us receives what we all deserve and that any are saved is quite a mystery um so i think i'll stop there um i don't know if that's the, the best answer or the fullest answer but it is an answer and i am thankful for that one that uh the, the question about aaron and the golden calf so um if you wish to submit questions please do so um i'll just take uh the next few questions tomorrow and we'll do this through this week and probably a little bit into next week as well okay let's pray father in heaven we thank you for your mercies which are new every morning and which are revealed clearly to us and to the world through Jesus Christ. His death, his resurrection, he, in so doing, he has uh, offered to the world mercy. And so in the mystery of the Aaron and golden calf story, Lord, we struggle to understand that. We thank you for the unity of your church and pray for a greater unity between Roman Catholics and Presbyterians and all Christian faiths and denominations. And Lord, we thank you for these sweet psalms and teaching us to pray. May we pray constantly. May we pray constantly as you prompt us through your spirit. And so we ask your blessing upon each of us, our homes, our loved ones this day as we make our prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, may the God who welcomes us into the family through baptism and blesses us through the mercy of Jesus Christ. May God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit watch over you this day and forevermore. Amen.